What is a Rashi? That's the first thing I'm going to talk about in this first video to a new course I'm teaching on the Rashis. So a Rashi, of course, as we know it, is one twelfth of the ecliptic circle. But we should start with what Rashi means. And Rashi means a heap or a clump or a pile. Okay? In the context of astronomy, in the context of astrology, um, that usually means simply a heap of degrees. So in the zodiac, we've got 360 degrees. In, the, in any circle, we have 360 degrees. And that circle is divided into 12 Rashis, or 12 piles of 30 degrees. That's one way to look at it. And in mathematics, that's exactly how a Rashi is worked with. In simply that, when we take a circle, and we want to take 30 degrees of a circle, we call it a Rashi. And they literally use this in old Hindu mathematics. And I've heard they also did the same in Greek mathematics, where 93 degrees would be referred to as three Rashis and three degrees. So three 30 degree segments and three degrees. So Rashi really is a pile of 30 degrees, just on a mathematical sense. And mathematicians would use this even if they weren't doing things bearing on astrology, just any time they dealt with the circle. Now in astrology, we have not only just a pile of 30 degrees, but a Rashi also becomes a pile of Varga charts. So every Rashi is divided into two to get the Hor, into three to get the Drekana, into four to get the Chatra Tamsha, and so on. And so we really have a heap of smaller portions of space. And so from an astronomical point of view, an astrological point of view, a Rashi is a pile of space, little bits of space. And of course, if, it would be so nice and easy if with astrology all we had to do was say, oh, we'll cut the circle into 12 parts, and Mars is in this third part, and this means this. End of story. But it's not, because life is much more specific than that. It's much more interesting than that. And so Mars at the first five degrees, at five degrees Gemini, is very different than Mars at 10 degrees, 11 degrees, 12 and a half degrees, in any other part of Gemini, because it's a different part of space. It's, a di it's in a different location. And really, as each planet moves, even a little bit, it goes into a different location. So Arashi, we can say, is a pile of, of, um, of little bits of space, okay, of little places that a planet can exist in. So we have to get away from thinking of Arashi as this broad thing, okay, as this thing that's just one thing and there's 12 of these one things. It's a pile of lots of little things and that lets us know that, let's say you had a pile of leaves that you were going to dig through. As you dug through those pile of leaves, you would constantly be encountering different things. You dig in those pile, dig through the pile of leaves for a little bit, maybe find a worm. Dig a little further, find a moth cocoon. Dig a little further, maybe find a snake. So as you dig through that pile of leaves, your experience is constantly different. And it's the same as a planet moves through a Rashi. As it moves through that Rashi, it experiences different things. And so I really like that they use that word Rashi in Sanskrit in Hindu astrology, in Vedic astrology, to describe a sign. Because it should be a reminder that when we look at a planet, we can't just say, oh, this planet's good because it's in this Rashi. As we have to look further, we have to look into where, right in where the Rashi, right in the Rashi where it's actually at. And we do that through analyzing the Vargas, seeing where that planet's at in its totality, not just where it's at based on a one twelfth portion. Okay? And so, the fact that we use Rashi to, to you know, call a Rashi something, lets us know that there's a lot more to it than just what we see on the surface. Okay, that we need to consider things beyond the fact that it's in a one twelfth sign. Now, Rashi particularly has to do with the, you know, with the chart, your birth chart of twelve signs. So this is Cancer Rashi, this is Leo Rashi, Virgo Rashi, and so on. But if you're looking at the Navamsha chart, the proper terminology is not saying this is Aries, Navamsha, or Aries Rashi in the Navamsha and Taurus Rashi in the Navamsha. No. It's Aries Navamsha, Taurus Navamsha. When we look at the D60, the Shashtiamsha, it's not proper terminology to say it's in the Rashi of the D60 
um, or it's in the 60 Rashi of Aries or Taurus. No, we just say it's in the Shashti Amsha of Aries, the Shashti Amsha of Taurus and so on. Because at that point we're looking at the smaller parts of space. Okay? Now, when we look at the Rashi chart, we call it a Rashi chart because it's a chart of the, of the piles, the 12 piles basically, the 12 piles of Vargas, piles of degrees, piles of smaller increments of space which have completely different um, results based on where a planet's at. So, don't expect the answer, the right answer about any question to come just because a planet's in a certain sign in the Rashi chart. Because it's where it's at in that sign that has a big part of it. So, I think they use the word Rashi to remind us to look further into the Varga charts, to look further into the differentiation of that space and not just have a 12-fold differentiation of space. Now, Parashara uses 15 additional Vargas, has the Rashi chart and 15 more. Then the Antajika takes the Rashi chart and 11 more Vargas. Tajika is the Persian system of astrology. And so these different schools of astrology realized that a planet at 5 degrees Gemini was different than it what, you know, acted very differently at 5 degrees than at 10 degrees. And it's through the Vargas that we know this is true. So for astrological purposes, a Rashi is a pile or a heap of Vargas. Okay? All right. And like I mentioned, in mathematics, a Rashi is a pile of 30 degrees. And there was, you know, that mathematicians used the term Rashi not in the context of animals like Aries and Taurus or anything like that, but simply as saying 93 degrees is three Rashis, three degrees. Okay? Now, the zodiac is composed of the 12 signs with the 12 Rashis. And zodiac, zo, comes from zoology, zoo, has to do with animals. It's a Greek, you know, root word that has to do with animals, okay? So the word zodiac is a Greek word. It comes of Greek origin, and it refers to this circle of creatures, okay? And in the zodiac, all the symbols are some creatures. Now, Libra is the scale, Sagittarius is the bow, but if we read the descriptions, it's a man in a bazaar with a scale, and it's a, a person on horseback with a bow. So they actually are people, creatures, or something. So all the signs are actually symbolized by, um, you know, something that has a corporal body that's capable of motion, a living being, a living something. Um, Aquarius is the water bearer who carries the pot. It's not the pot, it's the guy carrying the pot, okay? So that's why they call it Zodiac, because it has to do with different, zoo, um, you know, we can say zoological things. We've got the fish kingdom, we've got the insect kingdom, we've got mammal kingdoms, we have lots of human kingdoms, and so on. Okay, but basically the 12 signs of the Zodiac are different, are symbolized as different earth-dwelling creatures. And this aspect of the zodiac is likely from Greek origin. In the older Hindu texts, we don't see them really following um, this arrangement of Aries, the ram, and so on. Okay? And that has caused a lot of scholars to think that the 12 signs of the zodiac, the 12 fold division of the ecliptic, came from the Greeks, came into India from the Greeks. But we're going to talk about that a little bit more later, okay? Um, but in the context of calling these signs after animals, it's very possible that that habit came into India with Alexander the Great. And the reason I say that because before Alexander the Great's time, we don't see the zodiac, you know, the 12-fold division of the ecliptic called after animals. Jaime Sutras, which is probably before that time, actually written before that time, doesn't, you know, use the names. It uses the names, but makes fun of them. It uses names like, um, it uses the names of, this, uh, of the zodiac animals and so on. But it tells us to ignore those names and instead numerically turn that animal name into a number. And he basically says that that number indicates the sign. So he's basically calling the sign, signs number one, sign number two, sign number three. I think that's part of a more ancient tradition from India, that the 12 signs were simply named after the number one sign, the number two sign, the number three sign. And then the Greeks 
you know, brought in this more colorful um, names of the signs. Okay, but there's plenty of evidence that the Hindus had a 12-fold division of the ecliptic before the Greeks and India had a lot of commerce together. Okay, but scholars um, oftentimes, like I said, like to think that astrology came into India because of the fact that the Indians used these names on their zodiac signs that were established in Greek before they were discovered, you know, before they were common parlance in India. Okay? Now in Hindu astrology, the zodiac is called Kala Rupa, the figure of time, or the Kala Purusha, time personified, sorry, time personified. And so the zodiac is considered a circle of time, and it's symbolized by the cosmic man, with Aries the head, Taurus this part, Gemini this part, and down. So, when we really think of, in the context of Hindu astrology, what the signs are, they're the twelve body parts of, you know, of Vishnu, of the cosmic man. And so, from a Hindu astrology point of view, we should start studying the symbols of the, you know, twelve signs, not as Aries is a ram, but Aries is the head. Not Taurus is a bull, but Taurus is the face, and so on. And not Gemini being a pair of two people in close embrace, but, um, or a man with a club and a woman with a loot, depending on what, you know, uh, picture you want to use from what text, but that Gemini is the arms of the cosmic man, of the time personified. And so one of the things we're going to do in this course, we'll have a, a class where I just talk about the body parts and how that symbolizes what the signs are doing. And that's a very important part of what the signs are doing. And lots of ways I think we can get a lot more out of studying the signs in the context of the body parts than we will studying the signs in the context of their animal names, okay? Animal or human names, whatever. So the zodiac is the circle of time. Okay, so we need to remember that's ultimately what it is. It's time personified. It's the embodiment of time. Okay. Now, astronomically, the zodiac refers to the ecliptic, which is the path the sun, um, in its apparent motion around the Earth, makes. So it's the path of the sun, and the zodiac is used to measure time, because. Um, it's a measure of time in the context of the sun's motion is that constant hand on the clock. The sun takes a certain amount of time to go around the earth. It's the most stable um, cycle we have um, in our solar system. All the other planets, they vary the time it takes to revolve. Even the moon varies quite a bit. But the sun is that old reliable clock hand that comes around at the same time every um, you know, 364.2422 days. Okay? So, it's this Earth-Sun cycle is what you're looking at when you look at the zodiac. And that's the most important cycle in our solar system, and it's the foundation of time. And that's why they call this um, the zodiac in India, in, in you know, Sanskrit language, is the Kala Purusha, time personified. Now, one thing about astronomy and astrology they should match. So, anything that we do astrologically we should be able to see up there in the sky. We should see it happening. Okay? And we can see the, the zodiac signs. I don't even like using that word zodiac anymore. Um, we should call it the Kala Purusha or whatever. But we're in the habit of that, so we'll keep doing it. So, we can see the zodiac signs based on where the sun is. Now, we can see the moons. You know, the moon is related to the nakshatras, right? And the nakshatras are the lunar mansions or the wives of the moon, more appropriately, that the moon spends one night with each wife. And you can see, you can look up at night, and you can see where the moon is relevant to the stars and therefore relevant to the whole space around us, including the galactic center. And we can say, oh, the moon is in this nakshatra, and we can see that. It's a visual thing. But you can't see what star the sun is in front of. You know, because when the sun's out there, you can't see the stars. The reason you can't see the stars is because the sun is a bright star that obliterates the light of all the other stars, right? So we can't see what sign the sun is in based on stars. 
And that's one reason I don't agree with the use of sidereal signs for the zodiac. Because we can't astronomically see it. It's not observational. Okay? Now, what we can see where the sun is and, you know, what sign the sun's in, based on what's happening on Earth um, as the sun moves through the tropical signs. So, for instance, when the sun enters Aries, we'll see the sun due east, it'll rise due east, and the day and night will be the same long. Okay, so then we, we know just from observation, wow, the sun's exactly east, and the sun and the day and night were each 12 hours, so that means that the, that's, the sun just entered Aries today. And we, so we can know it based on the amount of light and the angle of the sun's light coming towards us. Then every day after that, the sun moves north until finally the sun is really far north. And the sun will be way out there. It will be at a far angle from due east. It will be eastern. It will rise in the eastern direction, but very much north of the east. Okay? And the day will be much longer than the night in the northern hemisphere. And of course, in the southern hemisphere, the night will be longer than the day at that point. Okay? So, based on where the sun is in the zodiac, the days are longer or shorter, and the sun rises more north or south of its east point. And it, stay, it spends all that time in the east point now. Like right now, we're in the middle of the winter where the sun is as far south as possible. So even though it's like 11 o'clock here right now, the sun's shadows are coming in really steep from the south. So usually high noon, if you look at your shower, you know, like on the first day of spring, um, if you look at your shadow at high noon, your shadow will be right around your body. It'll just be right in that space of your body. But in the winter, if you go outside at high noon, and you live in the northern hemisphere, and you look at your shadow, your shadow's going to, and you face south, your shadow is going to be way behind you. It will be really long and behind you because the sun is so much further south. And when the sun is the furthest south, we have the shortest day of the year and the longest night in the northern hemisphere. Or in the southern hemisphere, the longest night, sorry, the longest day and the shortest night of the year. Okay? So we can literally see what, you know, where the sun's at based on the angle the light's hitting us from. Where, you know, meaning where the sun rises, north or south of the exact east point. And we can also determine it based on the time the sun rises and it sets how long the day is versus the length of the night. So, the tropical zodiac signs are observational. We'll see something different. We use sidereal zodiac signs. We can't tell the sun's in any sign at all. There's nothing to let us know it's an Aries or Taurus or Gemini because we don't see any stars when the sun's out. And if that has no base, that's not um, related to the sun being north or south. And therefore the change of the length of days or any of that stuff I talked about. Okay. But we can see it tropically, but we can't see it sidereally. And of course, that motion of the sun, if it's more north or south, if the day is longer or shorter, that dramatically affects our lives, doesn't it? Okay, it very much affects um, the experience of life on Earth. Okay, now, in the 3rd century BC, the Greeks named the stars, the actual stars in the heavens, after the zodiac signs. Okay? I think that was a big mistake on their part, and it was an injustice to the stars, because the stars already had their names. The stars themselves were these small little constellations that had names. In India, we had the stars named as 27 or 28 nakshatras. In China, they had the stars named as 28 things. And the um, Chaldeans had the stars marked as 18 constellations. So different cultures had the stars named as certain constellations. And then the Greeks showed up in, in the 3rd century as the Kali Yuga descended and people got dumber and dumber. They, and they said, well geez, let's rename those stars after Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, and so on. Okay? And I think that's where the debate of tropical sidereal zodiac started to arise. Okay? And 
I think that renaming these old stars, which cultures had been calling by th for thousands of years, Aries, Taurus, Gemini, in the 3rd century BC, was just a real slap in the face to all the ancient wisdom bearing on the stars. Okay? But it happened, so now we have to deal with it. Now, as I mentioned, a lot of scholars like to say that the origin of the Rashis are Greek. Now, the scholars who say this are scholars who believe the Greeks developed everything, and the people who refute that are the people who believe that the, everything emerged out of India. And then there's the people, the scholars, who also are impartial. And the impartial scholars also arrive at the thing that the twelve Rashis, as named Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Tor etc., came from the Greeks. And that's very well founded. And I would agree with that. I would say, yes, the names of the Rashis, as Aries, Taurus, Gemini, came into India from the Greeks. I think that's most probable. However, um, you'll never hear me saying that the twelve-fold division of the ecliptic, what we call the zodiac now, that it originated in the Greeks. I don't think it did. I don't think Greece is an old enough culture to have originated it. And there's evidence in the oldest text from India that a twelve-fold division of the, you know, tropical circle was, um, you know, in the Rig Veda, actually. So, for instance, in the Rig Veda, oh, and also I wanted to mention the Babylonians had a twelve-fold division of the ecliptic um, in the Mul Apin, which is from about 900 to 1000 AD, B, sorry, BC. It's a stone tablet. It's a, it's a ta you know, something engraved in stone, actually. And it's very clear in talking about a 12-fold tropical division and an 18-fold lunar division of stars. And those are two different things, okay? So we see reference in um, old texts, but including the Surya Siddhanta. Or, sorry, not the Surya Siddhanta, the Rig Veda. So the Rig Veda is from about 3000 BC or so, you know, in a written form, supposedly. It's hard to know exactly when a lot of these came, things came about, but the Rig Veda has certainly been, you know, identified as one of the most ancient texts in the world, perhaps the most ancient, um, you know, written thing on earth, okay? The Hebrews have some things that like to compete with the Rig Veda, but the Rig Veda is certainly old. So in the Rig Veda, in, in, you know, one, in Book 1, the 164th chapter, Sutra 11, says, The twelve-spoked wheel of the true revolves around the heaven, oh, sorry, revolves around the heavens and never decays. 720 children in pairs, O Agni, abide in it. So, here he's talking about a twelve-spoked wheel of the true. What is the true? Well, the true could be like the name of the sun, okay? Um, it could be the true time, but it's something that's important, obviously, something that symbolizes the truth of our existence. So the twelve-spoked wheel revolves around the heavens and never decays, okay? So the, this wheel revolves around the heavens. What does that mean exactly? Well, it could mean it moves against the stars, it moves against the galactic center, it moves against the heavens. But the most important thing I want to emphasize in this sutra is says the twelve-spoked wheel of time. So we're taking a circle, a wheel, and we're cut of time. Oh, sorry, of the true, and we're cutting it into twelve parts. Therefore, we have a zodiac, not a zodiac of animals, but we have a twelve-fold division of the ecliptic, long before the Greeks were walking around doing what they do, okay, or doing what they did. And then he says, 720 children in pairs abide in it. Okay? And this hymn is to Agni. 720 children in, in pairs, O Agni, abide in it. And Agni, of course, is the deity of the sun. And it makes sense this hymn would, be dead, would have Agni in it, or some aspect of the sun in it, because, you know, the circle is created by the sun, right? Created by Agni, so to speak. And there's 720 children in pairs. Well, 720 is how many shashtiamshas there are, which is the smallest varga par Shara uses. 
and they're in pairs, where one degree equals two Shashtiyamshas. So 720 children in pairs, well, if we pair them up, we got 360 paired children, or 360 degrees. So this really clearly seems to be a sutra that's basically saying we got this circle of 12 parts that has 720 smaller parts in it that are paired into 360 degrees. That's the zodiacal circle, but it's not named Aries, Taurus, Gemini. There's nothing like that in any of the ancient texts from India. But they were certainly using and aware of a 12-fold division of the ecliptic with 360 degrees and 720 shashtiyamshas. Okay? So that's a pretty clear sutra. And so we can't say the Greeks originated this, you know, brought the 12-fold division into India. No, India had a 12-fold division long before. There's another sutra that's more mysterious. It's the same book, Book 1, Chapter um, 164 and Sutra 48. And he says, the fellies are twelve, the wheel is one, three are the knaves, but who knows it? Within, our, within it are collected 360, which are, as it were, movable and immovable. So this sutra gets confusing. You can really argue a lot of things that this may or may not mean. But some things are clear. The fellies are twelve. What's a felly? Well, if you have a wheel with spokes or sections, each section of the wheel is a felly. Okay, every part of the wheel that's supported is, a, is called a felly. So it's a portion of a wheel that's supported. So here we got twelve fellies, twelve signs of the zodiac again. The wheel is one. It's one wheel. And it says, three are the knaves, but who knows it? So there's three knaves, or three centers of this wheel. Oh, wow, fun. But who knows those centers? So this is a mysterious part. What are the centers? We'll get back to that in a minute. Let's get to the easy part. Within it are collected 360, 360 degrees, right? Um, within that. And a felly, again, is the, the, the part of the wheel supported by a spoke. Okay? So... Each part of the rim is supported by the spoke. So, 12 fellies means 12 big spokes. That's like the 12 divisions of the 12 signs. Then within it are collected 360. Collected 360. Which means each of the fellies has 30 things in its personal collection. And the word collection is, gives a similar connotation as a pile, right? You have a, a collection of degrees or a pile of degrees. So, again, it's a Rashi. And these, which, as it were, movable and immovable. So these 360 collected degrees are movable and immovable. What does that mean? They're both movable and immovable. It's hard to know what they meant. In my mind, this could possibly mean two things. Okay? They're movable in relationship to the galactic center. So the galactic center and all the stars move in relationship to those 360 degrees of the zodiac, because the zodiac is tropical, and then the stars, it, the, that tropical zodiac moves, and those degrees in that zodiac move relevant to the galactic center and to the degree, or and to the stars, okay? So it's movable in relationship to the galactic center and the starry sky of the nakshatras. And it's immovable as the fixed degrees of the sun's motion, because that's a fixed zodiac where we can count on the sun being at the same degree every year at the same time. Which creates the fixed background for the zodiacal motion of the planet. Okay, that's one possibility. Another possibility, the fixed 360 may be in the context of the zodiac, the ecliptic itself, and the movable 360 may be the rising of those degrees as the daily motion of the zodiac around the earth. Okay, so every day those degrees seem to be moving over the surface of the earth. Even though they're fixed degrees relevant to the sun and everything, and through the year, which is the sun's motion of the year, relevant to us on earth, every day the zodiac seems to move. All 360 degrees move around the earth, one degree rising every day on the eastern horizon. Okay, so that could also mean what they mean by movable and fixed. And then we have the problem of what are the three names? Okay, the three centers of the wheel. 
And they say, but who knows it? So the center of the wheel is something that we really aren't aware of, especially back then. So the centers could be the center that's the sun, that the earth revolves around. So the sun is here, the earth revolves around it, right? But from the ancient Hindus, the earth was in the middle and the sun rotated around it. So one circle that is not known may be that the, you know, the center of the circle could be the sun is the center of the circle. Modern astronomy says, yes, the sun is the center of the circle. That's one center. The second center could be the observational center, what it appears like from us living on Earth. From that point of view, it seems like the sun's revolving around us and Earth is the center. So Earth could be the second center. Then the third center could be the center of the Earth, around which the Earth revolves, and through that, creating the rise and fall of the, or the rising and setting of the degrees and, zo and of the zodiac signs. Um, you know, which allows those 360 to be movable. So there could be these three possible centers that have to do with the zodiac in one way or the other. Okay? So, those are some, that sutra is a little more mysterious, and so maybe as we learn more, we'll understand more about it. But again, the main point I want to say, we have sutras from 3000 BC that are cutting the, a circle into 12 parts. So they obviously had this idea of a 12-fold division of the heavens um, in Greece in 3000 BC, long, not in Greece, sorry, in India, in the Rig Veda, 3000 BC, long before the Greeks um, came into India which was like 300 BC. So the Rig Veda is the oldest of texts and predates, predates the Greek civilization of Alexander the Great by 3,000 years. So that's a big chunk of time. However, we can't blame the Zodiac on India just because of that. We can't say, oh, India is responsible for the Zodiac because we see this in the, um, you know, in the Rig Veda. The reason we can't because Throughout Earth, in different places of Earth, including places like even England, um, there are astronomical monuments that have, you know, all that remains of them is, is um, posts in the ground that have um, turned to, what is, what is it called? They've crystallized. So, petrified wood posts in the ground that have been dated, like from 6000 BC, and these posts are arranged in a way that they would indicate the motion of the sun in a 12-fold motion. So we have archaeological evidence that there was a 12-fold division, that they were tracking the sun, the equinoxes and the solstices, way back in 6000 BC for some purpose. If not astrology, what, for what purpose would it be? All mathematics was, all higher mathematics beyond what you can do on your fingers, was really developed for the purpose of astrology. Okay, so these things they do in the old world all had astrological significance because it was the super science. Now, 6000 BC is around the time that the legend of the Sirius Sedenta says the Sirius Sedenta was given to man, and the Sirius Sedenta tells us how to calculate the planets, without which we can't even do any astrology. So it's interesting that those time periods overlap. So we can see that there was a 12-fold division of the sky, of the ecliptic, going back to 6000 BC as far as there's some evidence towards concrete evidence, and then the legend of the Sirius Sedenta supports that as well. So now we can't say the Greeks brought the zodiac signs to India. We can, however, make a good argument that they renamed the zodiac signs. And I think the Greek names or symbols of the names, the ram and so on, are good, helpful indicators for the signs. But as you're going to learn in this course, there's so much more other great stuff. Like what I consider, what I would actually consider more important um, or equally important is just like the, um, the place the sign likes to be, like Virgo's mountains and Pisces' is ocean. Wait till you get we can to get into that class in this course. That's like really exciting when you understand the deep meanings of the simple place that the signs like to live in. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so I like to follow the 
you know, the Hindu idea of the zodiac, that the zodiac is the limbs, the body parts of Vishnu. Parashara tells us, the imperceptible Vishnu, Janardana, is the Kala Rupa, who is the figure of time, whose limbs become unconscious as the Rashis beginning from Mesha, or the Ram. So in Brihat Parashara, the text we currently have today, he uses the words Aries, Taurus, and so on in their Sanskrit words, the ram, the, the bull, and so on. But this sutra is one of the most important. The imperceptible Vishnu, Janardana, is the Kalarupa, figure of time whose limbs become unconscious as the Rashi is beginning from the ram, from Aries. So Vishnu is the absolute aspect of God that manifests himself as everything in creation. And in Brihad Parashara tells us that Vishnu manifests himself as the planets, and that these planets have divine consciousness. Okay? Um, and now he's telling us that Vishnu also manifests himself as the limbs of Vishnu. And he says, Janardana is the Kala Rupa, the figure of time, whose limbs become unconscious as the Rashi is beginning from Aries. So the limbs, the unconscious parts of Vishnu, the unconscious limbs, the body parts, the meat suit, so to speak, of Vishnu, is unconscious. That's the Rashis, that's the twelve signs of the zodiac. I think it's very important that we understand that the planets are conscious, and the limbs of Vishnu, which are the Rashis, are unconscious. Okay? That means they're in completely different ballparks. Now the planets, what ballpark are they in? They're up there in the sky. We can see them move. In fact, the planets are called stars. And they're considered to be moving stars in Hindu astronomy, compared to the stars that don't move, which are the nakshatra stars. Okay? So, um, and Chinese astrology also calls the planets stars. Okay, so they are stars, meaning they're in the stellar realm, they're in the heavens. Everything in the heaven that has a light that you can see is a star, so to speak. A light element in the heavens. And so, those planets are up there in the heavens, and they have consciousness. The nakshatras are up there in the heavens, and they also have consciousness. How do we know they have consciousness? Because they're symbolized by deities. Okay? Each one, each nakshatra is a deity with a certain power, a certain um, energy that it utilizes to serve creation. So they also have consciousness. And the nakshatras were put in the heavens by Varuna, who's the lord of consciousness. And the nakshatras are his body, essentially. And so, obviously the nakshatras are, have to be conscious entities. Parashar doesn't t talk about nakshatras. He doesn't give descriptions of nakshatras. We're expected to know all that before we even open up the Parashara text. Okay? So, nakshatras and planets are conscious. The Rashis are unconscious. They're just the limbs, the body parts. And that's one reason I advocate using the tropical zodiac over the sidereal zodiac. Because things to do with the stars, with the heavens, are conscious forces. Yet here, Parashara tells us, it's an unconscious thing, the Rashis. So if we calculate the Rashis relevant to the earth, meaning relevant to the, the tropics and the solstices, um, or the, sorry, the equinoxes and the solstices, whatever they're called, now we're dealing with a body-centered ideology. So the earth is like the body that is invigorated with life. Um, and it's invigorated with life based on the consciousness that's in the heavens. Okay? Just like our body, our meat suit, is just a dead thing. It's just meat. It's a meat suit. But the consciousness within it invigorates it and enlivens it. It's a consciousness that's important. When the consciousness leaves the body, the body has no value at all. It's just a, it's just a meat suit. Okay? So, the same thing's happening with the signs of the zodiac. The signs of the zodiac are the unconscious limbs, body parts of Vishnu, taken as all twelve, it becomes the complete unconscious body of Vishnu that is energized with consciousness from the planets and from the nakshatras. And so they're two different things. That's why I use nakshatras in, in, the, in the stars, or the stellar realm, the stellar circle. 
And the Rashis, the meat suits of Vishnu, are the earthly circle of the solstices and equinoxes. Okay? <clears throat> and the name they use for Vishnu here, they use the word Janardana. Vishnu, of course, has a thousand names, right? Um, and Janardana is the one who agitates man, the one who causes man to fear and worry. Well, one reason he does that, because as time, the Kala Purusha, as time personified, the motion of time, he makes us worry, because we know our time will run out. We only have so much time to get the job done. We're going to die in time, right? So there's that aspect of it. And also, he's also manifesting the zodiac, which is this circle of time through which our fate manifests. And of course, our fate manifesting can be a fearful, stressful event. So I think that's why they use this word name for Vishnu, Janardana, a more tough name when it comes to talking about the Rashis. Okay, this circle of time, which is kind of causes a lot of strain and stress and worry. So we have the planets and the nakshatras, those are the conscious entities, okay? The planets are the conscious producers, and the nakshatras are the conscious energies themselves that the planets can use to create, that, you know, uh, and both of these conscious forces um, create everything that is, okay? And live through everything that is, energize and endow everything that is with consciousness. But the concrete entities, the meat suits, the empty things that without the consciousness would have no meaning, those are the Rashis and the Bhavas which float on top of the Rashis, right? The Bhav Rashis give the Bhavas a place to exist. That's why we have 12 Rashis and 12 Bhavas instead of 12 Rashis and 27 Bhavas or something like that, okay? So the Rashis and the Bhavas being the unconscious entities or the meat suits that the concrete thing that's filled with the consciousness of the plants and the nakshatras are the realms within which the grahas and nakshatras produce and energize and that which they produce and energize. But it's the energy, the consciousness within those things that's the most important thing, of course, and that's the planets and the nakshatras. Okay? Alright, now Parashara then goes on um, in the Rashi chapter, as a chapter on Rashi's. In the third sutra, he tells us, the ram, the bull, the pear, the crab, the lion, the girl, the balance scale, the scorpion, the bow, the crocodile, the pitcher, and fish, all following each other. So first he says it's the unconscious limbs of Vishnu, and then he goes on and gives the names of the Rashi. And we should study those names and see what they mean. Okay? Um, now, all 12 Rashis are named after living creatures, okay? Some of them like, um, you know, the bow, Donis, or Kumba, the pitcher, or Tula, the balance scale, sound like just objects without a person or body, without a body involved. But if you read the descriptions later in Brihat Parashara, he says that, you know, Kumba is a man carrying a water pitcher, that Tula, Libra, is a man holding a balanced scale, and so on. And that Donis the bow, Sagittarius, is a man on a horse with a bow, an archer on the horse with a bow, of course. So they're all embodiments of things that have a body, of an animal body or a human body. Or, in the case of like Sagittarius, half the body is human, meaning there's an archer, and the other half is a horse. There's two bodies in Sagittarius, okay? So they're all living creatures, meaning they're all bodies that are endowed with consciousness. Okay, but their bodies is the key thing. The consciousness comes from the planets and so on. And when consciousness enters certain bodies, it experiences certain limitations, right? So again, this is Janardana, who causes us to have fear and worry. Why do, another reason we have fear and worry is because of, we have limitations imposed upon us. And we have limitations imposed upon us based on the body, our, the consciousness and habits, right? 
So that if a body, if conscious, the conscious, the divine consciousness manifests as an individual consciousness in an ant, it's limited to par compared to what that same divine consciousness can manifest an individual consciousness in a human, right? The human's less limited in completely different ways and in less ways than the ant is. So, the body that the consciousness enters determines limitations placed upon that consciousness. And that's what the signs of the zodiacs do. They place limitations on that consciousness. So when we see the suns in Aries, we're saying, the limitations of the solar consciousness is Aries limitations. And that's not very limiting and therefore the sun is exalted there. Then we drop the sun into Libra and we're saying, the limitations of the Libra body are great upon the sun. And therefore the sun is debilitated in Libra. So that consciousness of the sun is much more limited in Libra than it is in Aries. Okay? Another way we can say it, we can say the consciousness, because you know Aries is the head, we can say the sun, when it's in the body part of the head, has very little limitations, therefore it's exalted. Whereas the consciousness of the sun, when it's in Libra, which is the pelvic triangle right here, is much more restricted. Um, and therefore the sun's debilitated there. And then you can use those body parts once we learn them to understand what Sun and Libra means, what Saturn and Libra means, and why Saturn's exalted in Libra and debilitated in Aries and so on. So, but what I want to convey now is that as a, as a body that consciousness can enter, or as a body part that consciousness can enter, the consciousness that are the planets will be limited in their expression to greater or lesser degrees. And also the nakshatras that are underneath that body part are limited to a greater or lesser degree. So right now, so say in the middle, in not now, but in the deepest part of the Kali Yuga, Ashwini will be in Aries, where its conscious, expression of consciousness is very limited. In the Satya Yuga, Ashwini will be in Libra, and at that point, the consciousness of Ashwini is less lib is less liberate, or sorry, less limited in Libra, and therefore we have a higher age. So this happens where, as the yugas progress through their 24 or so thousand year cycle, the zodiac sign revolves around the nakshatras, giving rise to the nakshatras being more or less limited in their expression of consciousness. Okay, so look at the Rashi's. Even look at the houses, but really the Rashis. Look at the Rashis as limitations to the expression of a planet's consciousness. And also the houses do the same thing. That's why we have Dig Bala. So Saturn has Dig Bala in the seventh and none in the first. So the first Bhava limits the conscious expression of Saturn more so than does the seventh Bhava. Okay? So guess get, get this idea that. The consciousness manifested in a body will have certain limitations, and that's what Rashi's impose upon a planet. And debilitation and enemy signs and stuff like that, that imposition's great, and exaltation, don't even consider any limitation to it. Okay? Alright. And that, we'll learn how to work with that and make sense of that as we learn about, you know, what the signs represent. Okay? There's two Rashis, Sagittarius and Capricorn, which have been mystified. And I think this is due to the Greek influence, okay? Sagittarius is thought to be as a centaur. It's not a centaur. It is a centaur in some of the newer Hindu books, like Brihad Jataka considers it, you know, a centaur. A man with the first, uh, that Sagittarius is the first part is of a man with the hind parts of a horse. It's not. It's a man on a horse with a bow. So it's a man who's complete and a bow and a horse who's complete. So half a Sagittarius is a biped, the man, and the other half of Sagittarius is a quadruped, the horse. Okay? Um, but that's become mystified through the Greeks, but this isn't the old symbolism of it. In India, there's no sign of a centaur type creature. Greeks, of course, have centaur mythologies. And um, 
Centurions were, you know, there were Romans who rode on horses, right? The cavalry were centurions. So, um, we want to throw that concept out that Sagittarius is a centaur. No, it's a man on a horse with a bow. Okay? And we'll talk about that more later. And Capricorns is a creature with the front part of a deer and the rear part of a crocodile. That's what Brihat Jataka calls it. But in Brihat Parashara, that mythological weird creature does not exist. Um, Brihat Parashara simply says that Capricorn is Nakra, a crocodile. And he also calls Capricorn, um, yeah, he calls it Nakra, crocodile. Okay? Um, so, real simple, a crocodile. Now, in lots of texts, including um, um, Nakra, is also called Makara. Okay, now Makara is sort of a mythological creature. It's been identified as an ancient sea monster, as a crocodile, a shark, and a dolphin. So, it's an ancient sea monster identified as a crocodile, a shark, or a dolphin. I think it's probably originally a crocodile because they have ocean-going crocs that are like 23 feet long. And these ocean-going crocodiles will go thousands of miles out into the ocean and back. They can live in the ocean. They're saltwater-dwelling crocs. And they're the largest crocodile species on Earth. 23 feet crocodile. That's a huge friggin' monster. Imagine that. That's four times the length of a, of a five foot ten man practically. So your average height of, your is four times the length of an average man. That's like a big monster. So I think it relates to that. Sharks, yeah, big, great whites get pretty big, but I think that crocodile would be a lot more monstrous. And dolphins, of course, are not going to be too scary no matter how big they get. And crocodiles have the most anciently evolved forms. They have adapted the least in millions of years compared to any other reptile or large creature because they're so suited for um, survival already that they haven't needed to adapt. The habitats they thrive in, there have been plenty of those habitats that they haven't had to adapt to other types of habitats. So they're this very crystallized creature um, which makes sense considering they're ruled by this ancient old planet Saturn. So you should learn the names of these Rashis. So in Sanskrit, the words Parashara uses in the Sutra, Sutra 3 of the Rashi chapter, he uses Mesha for Aries, which is a ram, Vrisha for Taurus, which translates into the bull, Mithuna for Gemini, which means the pair. Mithuna does not mean twins. It means a pair of humans. Okay? Briya Jataka tells us that Gemini is symbolized by a man and woman, um, a man with a club and a woman with a lute in close embrace. Okay? It's the pair of humans. Okay? And it symbolizes the, uh, we'll get into what it symbolizes later. Karka is Cancer the Crab, Simha is Leo the Lion, Kumarika is the girl or, or Virgo, the girl. It's Kumarika. It's not the virgin. It's Kumarika, the girl. Kamarika is a young girl who's too young to have had puberty. She, duh, so she has to be a virgin, right? She hasn't even reached puberty. So how could she not be a virgin? But she's not the virgin. She's a young girl, who a prepubescent girl. And that's very different than a woman who's 30 years old, or 20 years old, or 16 years old, who's had puberty, yet who hasn't had sex. Those are completely different things. So don't call it the virgin, that's Greek. We're not going to use the Greek stuff. It's the girl. And as we explain that symbolism later, you'll understand how, yeah, I see how Virgo is a girl, not an old virgin. Okay? Tula is the balance scale, or Libra. The word he uses for Scorpio is Ali, Ali, A-L-I, which is Scorpio, the scorpion. The name of, Ali is the name of a scorpion. And there's other names they'll use for Scorpio. They'll call it Kita Rashi, which means insect Rashi. They'll call it Rishika Rashi. But in this sutra, he uses this word Ali, which is scorpion. Then Donis is the bow, that's Sagittarius. Nakra is crocodile, that's Capricorn. 
And I'm glad he used this word Nakra. He didn't use Makara, so he didn't make us go, what is the Makara monster? He actually used the word Nakra crocodile. And I really think that crocodile is the best animal to symbolize the crocodile. Of course, crocodiles are in India. They had crocodiles in Egypt. They had crocodiles, of course, were known about in Greece because Greece were closely connected to Egypt. So, this part of the world that we have our astrology roots in, whatever culture, any all zodiacal astrology, whether India, Greek, or Persians, um, Egyptians, they were all aware of the crocodile animal. Okay, and of course, crocodiles are on are also found in North and South America in one form or the other. So it's a species that does have a worldwide distribution for the most part. Then Kumba is Aquarius, the pitcher. Um, it's a man with a pitcher. That's the important thing. Then Mina is the fish or Pisces. Okay? So um, that's the words, the Sanskrit word he uses. So this is a very broad overview of what is a Rashi. It's a heap of something. Let's always remember, it's not just the twelve-fold part that's important, it's where in that pile of that, of that one, there's twelve piles, but where in that pile is the planet? We always have to understand astrology in that context, which means in the context of the Varga charts. Then, the Rashis are the unconscious limbs or body parts of Vishnu. The limit which is the limitations, the body puts the limitations upon the consciousness that's in that Rashi. And that consciousness is determined by the nakshatra that's in that Rashi and the planets in that nakshatra, or sorry, and the planets in that Rashi. The expression of those, that consciousness is limited by that body or body part of the Rashi. So it literally is the body parts of Vishnu. The limitations of my head are very different from the limitations of my foot, right? Therefore, the limitations of Aries is much different than the limitations of Pisces, my feet. Okay? And this will all make really concrete graphic sense to you as you learn about the meanings of the different body parts, what they symbolize, what limitations they oppose upon those planets. And then, um, and then also, there are also different life forms. The Rashis are symbolized by different life forms, a crocodile, um, a scorpion, a crab, and so on. Humans in close embrace, a pair of humans. A pair of humans, Gemini, has very different limitations than a prepubescent girl does, Virgo, who has very different limitations than a man on a horse with a bow, which is Sagittarius, who has very different limitations than a man carrying a water pot, which is Aquarius. So while we have several signs um, that are symbolized by humans, like Libra is another one, the man with a set of scales, um, they're all humans, but all these humans are limited in very different ways. Being in the body of a guy on a horse with a bow limits you in a different way than being in a prepubescent body of a young girl. Okay, So it's the bodies, whether as a life form or as a body part, that limits the expression of the planets and the chakras found in that Rashi. That's one. That's a really important idea to convey through us, is that these body parts, these Rashis, as being the unconscious aspects of Vishnu, it's unconsciousness that limits us, right? It's a form that limits the conscious expression of the planets. When we drop a planet into, when we drop a planet into a sign, consciousness awakens in that sign. That body gets enlivened with consciousness that we're actively using. But that consciousness is limited based on that body of the Rashi it's in. So one of the most important things I can convey in this first intro lecture to this course is that the Rashis are what imposes the limitations upon the consciousness of the planets found in that Rashi. Okay? And ultimately everything we do with planets and Rashis has to do with that simple fact. So you really want to get that idea through your head. It's an unconscious thing, it's a body, it's a meat suit with certain capabilities. So when the consciousness plugs into it, it can do certain things and it can't do other things. Okay, um, much more to come. Thank you.